You're watching In Technology, a video cast where you can get smarter about cybersecurity, sustainability, and technology. Here are your hosts, Tom Garrison and Camille Moorhart. Hi, and welcome to the In Technology podcast. I'm your host, Tom Garrison, and with me, as always, is my co host, Camille. And today we have a special guest from Intel, uh, Jennifer Huffstetler. She is the corporate product sustainability lead for Intel. She's also a 26 year, almost 27 year Intel veteran. And we're happy to have her. I've worked with her for a lot of years. So this is kind of a fun thing for me today to be able to have her on as a guest in the podcast. So Jen, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Tom and Camille. Yeah. So today's topic, we wanted to talk about sustainability. And we've had a couple of guests already sort of give a, a flavor for sustainability and what is it and 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 whatnot. But we wanted to have you on today to, to focus on what does it mean at a corporate level? What are, you, what are the kinds of things that you're looking at uh, to try to achieve in your role at Intel and what other companies might be able to take away from that? In my new role, we're basically looking after where our customers have set goals, how to help them lower their carbon footprint as we're on this mission to achieve sustainable compute. And that builds upon this incredibly strong and long legacy that we have in our own internal operations, where for decades we've been looking after our environmental footprint in each of the locations where we operate. Mm -hmm. And maybe for some of the people that aren't quite as familiar with that, can you give just some examples on... Uh, I guess Intel as a company, what what are some of the things that we've done from a sustainability standpoint that maybe people aren't aware of? Yeah, it's a great question. We we have in the last decade alone lowered our carbon footprint by more than eighty percent than it would have been otherwise. Some of the ways that we achieve that is through our extensive use of renewable electricity across our manufacturing operations. We've achieved over 80% uh, up until this point and, you know, are on track to continuing to hit our goal of 100% renewable electricity. That translates directly into the products that we build in our factories. They're built with renewable electricity, which actually lowers their embodied carbon footprint. Intel's not only looking after carbon, we're also deeply engaged in water and waste. And so we have many projects that we put forth around the world to do water restoration in the local communities where our manufacturing sites uh, are sitting. Uh, we also are looking at, and it's such that we've achieved net positive water. Uh, you know, when you step back, that was one of our goals that we set as a company. And we actually achieved that just, you know, a few weeks ago. So really seeing the precious resources that we have on the planet, energy, um, you know, lowering the carbon emissions, water is another precious resource, and we're really looking to take care of our consumption of that. And then the last piece is about waste and how much we're sending to landfills, really looking throughout our operations to ensure that we're, you know, upcycling, reusing chemicals um, and other materials throughout our factories, such that we've now achieved um, five percent waste than it would have been without all of those activities as well so you're kind of going through what um the manufacturing or production of the products that exit <laughs> the manufacturing facilities are, are consuming what about the products themselves are, are they is that a focus also yeah so you know i have a partner in our operations who helps to drive all of that impact and that lowering our environmental impact um, in the product space, the classes of segments that we're operating in, data center class processors, right? Enterprise class PC processors, right? All of those are built with, you know, leadership with this 80% renewable electricity. But now when you up-level it to look at the product features, uh, the platforms that they go into, and even for the data center world, we want to look at the overall data center and how it's architected. And then for an enterprise user or a consumer, where should they be running that workload? Can they make choices? Because we all know 
that it's human choices that are driving, you know, whether something is a higher carbon footprint choice or a lower carbon footprint choice. So we have product uh, features and capabilities today, uh, as well as roadmap over time. So I can describe a little bit more of those for you as well. Yeah, I think um, I think most of our listeners would love to hear, you know, and and not. I mean, obviously, you you work in uh, uh, the the data center part of Intel's business, but obviously, as a company, we've got you know product groups across uh, client business. The one that I actually am part of, we have a, a Internet of Things uh, group and whatnot. Um, so, can you give us a flavor for some of the work that's going on? In, in all of the groups uh, that, you know, to, to achieve our sustainability goals? Yeah, well, why don't we start first with, with your area, Tom? Our teams have been really working for several years to consider what would it look like to have a sustainable PC? In fact, we just, you know, recently launched our most sustainable Nook ever, um, which is really looking holistically at the system design. And so it not only includes features at a chip level to ensure that, you know, when under AC platform operation, that there's it's power optimized, right? So it's only consuming the energy it needs uh, when plugged in. But at the platform level, looking at the overall motherboard design, um, identifying whether there's ways to reduce componentry. Um, so you can have fewer components, which means, you know, a, a smaller supply chain of impact, right, as you're sourcing those materials. And even looking at the references motherboard to figure out, you know, could you separate it into modular pieces so that you're not burdening an entire PC platform with, you know, the lowest common denominator, right, that needs the most layers or carbon in a motherboard. Um, so the team did a lot of great innovation already in a concept that was launched uh, last year in December uh, in partnership with Dell uh, called the Luna concept. And they're now actively working on continuing to further uh, the, that work, um, bio-based materials and beyond, uh, to achieve a new goal that they announced just this year um, around lowering our reference platform. So everybody doesn't buy a Nook or a Dell platform, but Intel enables the entire industry with our reference platforms. And they've taken on that goal to now lower uh, the carb embodied carbon of those reference platforms by 2030. Does Intel or, or other um, companies take into consideration the, the, I guess, carbon emissions or for lack of a better term, of the employee base and consider that something that they have a kind of purview over to try to help reduce, like, for example, um, flying in airplanes or daily commutes or things like that, that technology can alleviate if you were to make it a goal? Uh, yeah. So when a company is looking at their carbon reporting in their corporate, you know, social responsibility report, um, they're using another tool called CDP to roll up all the details. That's all included, right? It's everything in our embodied carbon footprint, what it takes to make a core processor. Uh, it includes everything from, you know, what it takes to run the factory, any emissions that come from our factory, and then the upstream supply chain, as well as those flights that we take, um, whether it's, you know, working on those designs with our partners uh, in Asia, uh, visiting customers, all of that's included. So for Intel, everybody doesn't report equally, I think is something to know that this is a uh, fast evolving space and you know the standards are still being debated and they're not as clear. And that's that's an area where we're, we're partnering with others to seek to drive standards. But we believe foundationally that you need to understand the whole impact that the products that you're building have um, if you're really going to put action plans in place to reduce it. So Camille, yes, there's things every employee can do. It's the miles we drive to and from work, whether using an EV or uh, electric vehicle or taking a gas gasoline powered car, all of those things go into that report. Um, but we're really excited uh, that we're, we're in the process of activating across Intel's entire company. How do they align to support this vision that we have towards sustainable compute uh, with that first major milestone that we've put out there. 
So Jen, you mentioned that um, not all companies do it the same way. And I'd like to try to explore that for just a second, because uh, for I think most people understand for Intel, we manufacture our own chips. So we not only design our chips and whatnot, but we take it all the way through manufacturing and then we sell out to our customers. But there's actually very, very few companies that do that. Uh, most companies uh, will design a chip and then they will give it to another company to manufacture that chip for them. And in most cases, that's TSMC in Taiwan. When uh, a reporting actually happens, I'm, I'm curious, like how, how do you take that information, which in Intel's case is kind of end to end because we're in that unique position to, you know, to report everything under this one roof, whereas other companies maybe only if they were, if they're talking about you know sustainability it's only their little bit of it it's not the whole story so how 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 do you see that evolving over time how we're working with industry is we've actually convened uh semi is the consortia that uh where all of the semiconductor companies around the world convene and our lead uh TD technology development leader and Kelleher announced the Green Chemistry Consortia, where we're really having a whole sustainability swim lane that has just been kicked off to start to address those issues directly and to drive the standards across the semiconductor industry. And so we're really proud to, to help get that kicked off and be you know one of the founding members of that. That's where you're going to see these standards start to get defined and evolve. What do you think is the driving reason for companies trying to engage in sustainability practices and products? I mean, what <clears throat> is it to get more customers? Is it out of and the goodness of their hearts? What what is it? What's driving it? It seems like such um, a great emphasis, you know, in the last few years. There's been kind of a turn. Yeah, Camille, it's even been more recent than that. That. Folks have started thinking about it, but in the last 18 months, it just shot up. And I, I'd say the primary factor driving businesses, although, you know, the goodness of their heart, the care for the planet, leaving a, a legacy for their grandchildren or their children, like those are all strong factors. Um, the social um, demographic changes of the next generation expecting to work for a company that values and has a credible sustainability strategy is a new factor in even competing for talent. Um, but the primary reason is really regulations, right? We know that the EU is far advanced uh, in the US on this, but even our own SEC is now um, put, put forth um, their draft proposals on how they're going to start driving uh, standardization in the reporting, and, you know, really holding companies accountable um, to not, you know, what's known as greenwashing, just calling things green because they are. Um, so on the bright side, this is an area where I think regulation um, in this case is is really going to be important and more important to to see the pivot in the investment across the global economy. Um, you know, some examples of what's happened is data centers um, haven't been able to be built if a local economy uh, has, you know, so much renewable power or total electricity, even if you're an island like Ireland and you bet part of your local economy on hosting data centers for Europe, when that segment of your economy takes up 17% of your total island's power, you notice. And when it's projected to grow to 30%, you know, you're, you're really looking for partnership from industry to demonstrate how they're going to lower their power consumption, you know, implement renewable energy um, to accommodate that growth. Um, the same thing happens uh, in the client space where, you know, some of our customers were unable to ship product because they're not meeting these new regulatory requirements. Um, so I think this is an area where the EU is ahead and it's kind of, you know, leading the charge across the board. And then you get the boards of companies asking what the strategy is within each company. So multifaceted. So I'm curious if, if, if you can share with folks as a product person where you've now kind of jumped into the sustainability role, 
some of the cool things that you're seeing. And and one, for example, one that I'm uh, I'm aware of, and it's been around for a while, but now seems to be really taking off is like immersion cooling in the data center where you you literally submerge the server boards, which are, you know, super hot and uh, you put it in a fluid and the fluid boils and then that's how you cool them. But it's non-conductive because you think, oh, you put it in water, of course, you'd fry the board. But if you do it in a non-conductive fluid, you can do this. So there's some really cool technology things that are that are coming about. And I, I, I'm just wondering if you have any off the top of your mind or off the top of your head that you could share with folks on uh, what's happening. When you look at the data center level, um, there's many factors to consider. There's the energy, the efficiency of the utilization of the energy coming into the data center, known as the PUE, um, but there's also the water usage. And what's really exciting about the technology that you just mentioned, Tom, is that it not only enables higher compute density per watt, right? So you really think about that. That's really what's what everybody is looking for. Am I able to um, get my work done with less power? Um, you're able to do that in immersion by running the processors potentially even hotter than they are today. Um, but the amount of work that could get done in a data center is still greater. And so you get a greater compute efficiency per power. Well, what people don't realize is it's not just like the electricity. You think of a pipe you know, going into the CPUs in the server. It's also, it's, that's the energy in to a, a data center, but you also have a bunch of energy out. So that those electrons get transformed into heat. And so then you have to spend a lot of energy in a data center to keep it cool. And, and things like immersion help you in that regard as well. It's not, it's not a panacea, but it's certainly that density problem and, and the cooling problem. You save a lot of money in, in, in a bunch of different ways. So yeah, it's great for the planet, but it also is a way to solve these other problems. Yeah, you can actually reduce the failure of fans in a server. You're reducing because you don't need fans in a server because it's immersed. Um, you don't need as much cooling to your point in the total data center. So you don't have to power the cooling system for the data center. So those pieces get removed. And then to your point on um, you know, the heat that's generated, we're seeing a lot of um, data centers, you know, having showcases where they're able to reuse that heat um, for purposes in Barcelona, they have connected that heat, which is now consistent, right? When you've got this cooling mechanism um, that is liquid based, um, you're, you're keeping it at a constant temperature. Well, that's really a, a useful resource going back to our limited resources that we have. And we know over in Europe right now, the cost of heating is going up. Right, but this is a consistent, renewable uh, uh, source of heat, and they've now piped it into the district heating. So it's something that becomes a benefit to the community versus, or the building. You could think data centers can go inside a building. They don't all need to be um, football field size, uh, even smaller uh, data centers. You know, many racks. You could still repurpose that heat, and we see even smaller customers in Europe doing the same thing. Um, so there's a lot of benefits in that technology. I would say, you know, the other pieces that really matter, Tom, are the, the features inside the products that really help you to optimize the silicon that's already there in your data center, right? So we look at some, a product like a Xeon, and there's been innovations over, you know, decades to put accelerator, accelerator engines inside the Xeon to accelerate the workload and offload the main core to do the rest of the work. Uh, so when a, a customer takes advantage of those aspects, they're really able to see you know, up to a 4X improvement on their performance per watt by utilizing those accelerators inside the silicon. Um, we've got software tools, uh, libraries, reference architectures to help you know, share how to, to utilize those. But to me, that really is the number one thing that's going to be able to help the planet. You know, today, software is really inefficient. Um, we know that coders' role is to deliver their product time or service time to market. And they inherently have become less and less efficient because they didn't need to. 
um, over the last decades while more and more compute was delivered. In, in the beginning, assembly code was very efficient because there wasn't a, a lot of compute resources. So you really had to be efficient with your code. Um, so that's some of the work you're going to see us driving around green software, um, really looking at your software efficiency, the energy use of your software, uh, utilizing AI to scan your environment. And, you know, we've got a couple of examples with uh, customers where they're able to lower their power and their energy usage, which directly translates to uh, carbon lowering as well um, by 20% in some cases, 60% across a range of use cases, whether it's logistics or uh, telecommunication networks and beyond. And so when you really start to think of like one of the key factors uh, overall in lowering footprint, applying AI to your your code to make sure it's efficient to your you know overall processes in whatever business you are in, and you're going to find efficiencies. You're going to be able to optimize the power uh, within the system that you have by utilizing the telemetry that we have on the platform, as well as those accelerators that are inside the product. Are we starting to see that as kind of a major theme in? marketing of software? I mean, is it, has that arrived already? Because when you're talking about, you know, 17% of an island's, you know, energy consumption, if you can drop that by even just a little bit, that's obviously a big deal. So um, <clears throat> is it already happening? Has it been happening for a long time? Or is this kind of brand new, this ability to, uh, you're not even just talking, taking advantage of, of the silicon through the software, but also looking at overarching workloads and kind of optimizing even what hours you're running them and things like that? It's it's newer that folks are really looking at how to deliver a carbon impact to their CEO, to their board, right? That's why I mentioned the regulators and then it comes through the board. Everybody is looking for ways that they're lowering their carbon footprint. Um, so I, I think that focus is a little newer versus just getting the work done. Um, we're also starting to see uh, customers relax what well, previously were pretty hard SLAs, so their service level agreement. And when they're looking at the trade-off, like, do I need the highest precision AI training or can it be um, a little bit lower and I get 80 or 90% of the way? That's probably good enough given the power trade-off. And so you're going to start to see more customers make choices. It goes back to that human choice of, is it really worth the extra energy for this particular workload? Um, the, the research in academia, um, the examples through the customers are just starting to help demonstrate um, that direction that we really need to get to uh, as a computing industry. Um, I think the green software, the tools aren't yet there for the average developer to know, you know, I mentioned the standards aren't that great. Um, so when the average developer sees their bill, you know, if you will, their, their energy bill, their carbon footprint bill, it's hard to know like what's inside it because it's a black box and you don't know what you're being reported. Um, but that's one of the missions that we're on is to try to build tools for developers to understand the energy usage um, and the carbon intensity of that by understanding where in the world they're operating. Um, some locations have far fewer renewables, renewable electricity available, and your carbon intensity is gonna be higher for the same workload. Um, so, you know, that part's very new. It'll take several years, um, but I'll just mention one of the other product pieces that Intel's, you know, really invested in is driving renewable electricity everywhere that we can. And so, we have through our IoT team that's focused on energy, the energy vertical, they've partnered across the ecosystem to pull together a consortia of a full solution um, to or renewables, the hardware deployment, the software deployment, all the way down, you know, whole reference architecture to enhance the, the substations in the grid because renewable electricity is inherently unreliable and it's unpredictable, and that's not what the current grids were built for. So you need a way to be able to handle that variable load line that's coming in and, you know, ensure that it does, as you onboard renewables, that it doesn't have, you know, detrimental consequences to your overall grid and your commitments to the rest of the customers. 
Um, so we're, we're looking across the board um, from the PC client, as we talked about, the data center, out to that, that network and the energy um, to really bring the renewables uh, everywhere that we can. Well, Jen, it feels like we could keep talking about this for a long time, but uh, I think we should end it here. But I, I do want to thank you for coming in to the podcast and and sharing the work that Intel's doing and 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 some of the exciting things that are coming across the industry. So thank you. Yeah, I'm very very happy to have the opportunity to share it here, and thank you to the listeners for your time. Appreciate it. Never miss an episode of In Technology by following us here on YouTube or wherever you get your audio podcasts. The views and opinions expressed are those of the guests and author and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Intel Corporation.